Today's daf we're going to be learning is Tubot, daf kav zayin. Today's daf is sponsored by Emma Rimberg in loving memory of her mother, Marjorie Glick, Miriam Chana Bat Menachem Mendel, and Rachel, who died one year ago. I miss her smile, her support, her love, and the fun times we had together. As a child, she taught me. As an adult, she taught all of us. She lived her long life with happiness, stoicism, culture, and intelligence. A proud Jew, a staunch Zionist, and to me, mommy, and to me, mommy, I think of her every day with love. Okay, we're going to get started from the top of our daf. We started yesterday with the Mishnah about a woman who was taken and imprisoned by Gentiles. If we distinguish between a case where it was a monetary issue, where we're not worried that she was raped by them because they didn't treat the women as ownerless property in those cases, as opposed to Nefashat, if it was capital crime, then she'd be forbidden to go back to her husband, assuming her husband was a Kohen, because we could assume she was raped. Or according to Rashi, there's a concern that she actually willingly entered into relations with them because she was treated as ownerless properly by everybody. Apparently, it could be that in the end, she did it willingly and therefore would be forbidden even if he wasn't a Kohen. We said there was a debate about how to understand the Mishnah. Then we have Rav Shmuel Bar of Yitzchak, who said in the name of Rav that this is only if the Jews were in charge. Then we distinguish between money and capital. If the Gentiles were self-ruling, then they wouldn't even care if it was a monetary issue, there, there'd be no concern that they wouldn't get their money back if they raped the women, in which case they would rape the women in, in, in those situations as well. To which Rav a question based on a mission in Eduyot about testimony of Rabbi Yossi Akoin or Rabbi ben Akatsav, who talked about a case that happened in Ashkelon, which was a place where the Gentiles were in charge. And we saw here that the witnesses came and said, we saw her being taken into captivity, but right, and, and that she was made as collateral and we saw, though, that nothing had happened. Now, if it weren't for their testimony, right, we would have assumed that something had happened, which means that in Dine Mama note, right, you see that, um, sorry, my mistake, it was that only because there were witnesses that the, oh, the issue was here. If there weren't witnesses, it would have been a problem. However, Rava says it's clear, though, it's only because she was taken as collateral and they seem to assume that if she was just taken as a prisoner, it wouldn't be the same. And then it seems like there wouldn't be a, a concern, even though it was monetary issues in a place where the Gentiles were in charge. And that goes against what Shmuel, what Rav Shmuel said. Came the Gemara and rejected that and said, no, just because it said that she was taken as collateral for a loan, that was specifically the case that happened. But it would have been the exact same thing even if she was just taken into jail, in which case we see that there's still a concern. Now comes the second version of Rav, Ika de Amri, second line on our daf. Some people say, Amarava, instead of bringing this Mishnah in Adiyotah's contradiction, he brought this Mishnah as proof. Af Ananami Tanina. I also can prove that, and I can say that exactly what he said, it also appears in the Mishnah Adiyotah. Exactly the same case. She was taken as collateral for a loan in Ashkelon. Her family members, all the Kanaanim, said, no way can we marry this woman. However, witnesses came and said, no, no, nothing happened. If you believe that she... You believe their testimony that she was taken as collateral. You have to take their full testimony. And then she's okay. And if you don't believe that, well, I'll tell you sure or not. Basically, if you're going to accept their testimony, accept that she's okay. So now again, it's only because the witnesses came that it's okay. Now in this reading, Rava says, And number one, it was a monetary case. It's only because Adim came and saved her. But if Adim hadn't come, it would have been a problem. And they assume right now the opposite of what we assumed in the first case. My love, shouldn't it not make a difference whether she was taken as collateral or whether she was taken as prisoner? This is the conclusion of the previous one is basically his first thinking here, to which the Gemara says, lo, you can't use this as proof for the halacha that Rav Shemal said, or in Ashani, you could say taken as collateral is much different. There, they basically claim they owned her, and of course they can make her own this if they want. Whereas opposed to if she was just taken as a prisoner for something she did wrong, she wouldn't necessarily have been owned this. 
So this cannot be used as a proof. So those are the two different readings. And that's all within the reading where we started of Rav Shmuel, of Rav Yitzchak, who says in the name of Rav, modifies our, qualifies our Mishnah that it's only when Yad Yisrael is in charge. The Jews are, it's under Jewish rule. Comes a second version now. Those were two versions of Rav, whether he brought the source in, Mish, in the Mishnah Eduyot to contradict or the Mishnah Eduyot to support. Now we have a different reading of Rav Shmuel. Some people started with a contradiction. It's not. It says in our Mishnah, right? by a money issue, she's permitted to go back to her husband. And that contradicts the following source in, now it's brought, the whole thing in the beginning is brought as a contradiction. They don't even tell you the whole Mishnah. They assume you know it by now. In that case was Mamon, and it says there, Tama de Edimi Right? Only because there were witnesses. If there hadn't been any witnesses, then she would have been forbidden. Ooh, and which and what do we see in our mission? She's not forbidden if it's if it's uh if it's Dine Mamano, if it's money issues. Umishane to resolve this contradiction, in comes Amar Rav Shmuel Bar Rav Yitzchak. And notice he doesn't quote Rav in this version. He just comes to resolve the contradiction himself. Lo kashya kan sheyad Yisrael takifal of dekochavim kan sheyad of dekochavim takifal atzmam. And then he distinguishes between the two cases and says, in the case where we forbade it, it's because the Gentiles were in charge. In our mission, it's because the Jews were in charge. And with that, we resolve the contradiction by bringing the same solution. The last line in the mission it said al yedei nefashot asula. So now, what's a case of nefashot? If you want to be more clear, I'm a rav kigon nishe ganve, like the wives of robbers. Okay, robbers in those days, apparently Rashi says they were hung, and then they would abuse their wives, they would take their wives and their daughters and rape them. So that's what he says, it must be the women of Ganavi. Okay, we said when we learned the Mishnah that perhaps it was the women themselves who were guilty, or perhaps it was their husbands. Here he gives a case where it's the husband was the thief, and she was the wife of. Levi Amal, he disagrees with Rav and said, no, Kigonish Tosha Ben Dunai. Ben Dunai's first name was Elazar Ben Dunai. It comes up in another sugya where he was a, a murderer. That's what we mean when we say in the Pashot. Amr says it's only if they were already convicted. Before they're convicted, they don't make the wives ownerless, which makes a lot of sense. Rabbi Yochanan says even if was it wasn't Gmardin, and I was thinking about Rabbi Yochanan, it could be that in some places, it's true they have a judgment, but it's really a fake, right? It's not a real judgment. They're not really judging them. It's clear they're going to convict them anyway. And maybe that's why he thinks even before that, they already rendered their wives ownerless because it was basically a done deal even before the baiting decides. Because remember, we're talking about Gentile courts and not Jewish courts. A new mission. Ir Shekavshua Karkom. We now have a, a army comes into the city. Rashi says, by the way, it was a siege. They besieged the city. All women married to Kohanim in the city cannot go back to their husbands. And not only that, but any woman in the city can't marry a Kohan because there's an assumption that they were raped. If there's witnesses that nothing happened, you can even accept a, a Canaanite slave or a maidservant. They can be believed to help this woman. Okay, we're going to get much more into detail about this later. The only person we don't believe is the person himself or herself. Okay, if it affects that person, the, the man, the husband or the wife themselves, they're not believed. Urim Binhu comes the Gemara and brings an immediate contradiction. It says in another Tanaitic source, if an army comes to the city in a time of peace, Chaviyot Ptuchot Asurot Stumot Mutarot. Now we're talking about a totally different topic. Yein Nesach, it's called. That is wine that's uncovered when there's a Gentile around, the Gentiles nearby, or could potentially have used the wine. There's a concern that maybe they offered it up to their gods. And if they offered it up to their gods, right, it would have to be someone who worships idols, that would, and they would do this, they would do Mino Sech at Ayayin, that was, was called, offer it up to their gods. We're not allowed to use it, it we'll drink it because it's like a Vodazara, okay, idol worship. So, that's why we have all these issues with wine and Gentiles and all that. So now, if they come in a time of peace, then we have to assume if you had open barrels of wine, that they might have offered them up as a libation to their God. And therefore, they're forbidden. Stumot, ones that are sealed, are permitted because they won't offer it up unless it's open. And if it would have been opened, you would have noticed. 
Bishat milchama, but in a time of war, if this army comes into your city in a time of war, they don't have time to start. That's a good question. Do they not have time to drink the wine or do they not have time to offer it up as a libation to their God? Maybe they will drink it, but they don't have time to start doing some sort of religious ceremony there. So if that's the case, how do they have time to rape women? Okay, to which you might answer, and this is what the Gemara answers, what you might have thought. Amar of Mary, live all yesh pnai p'nai, l'nasech, ein p'nai. Great line, right? They always have time to have, to find women to rape. That they'll find time for, even though they don't necessarily have time to offer up their wine as libations to their gods. Rabbi Yitzhak bar al-Azhar mishmei Now this line is very complicated. Commentaries have many different interpretations about what this means, what he's answering or responding to. In any case, we'll try to go with one interpretation, but know that there are many. Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Elazar, in the name of Chizkia, says, Kam bekarkom shalotam achut, kam bekarkom shalmachut acherit. We can distinguish this halacha. Now, many people say we're talking about the halacha in the Mishnah, that we're basically going to assume these women are going to be forbidden to their husbands. That's in a karkom of machut acherit. If a different um, uh, someone from a different region comes in. Because if a different region comes in, they'll often rape the women. If it's under the same authority, and now there's all different opinions about what this is, maybe the people are rebellious, but the authorities are all the same, or maybe it's a nearby city and then they want to take them, Rashi says, to work for them, then they're going to besiege the city, but they're not going to come in and they're not going to rape the women because they want to have relations with this people that they're conquering. So, because of that, okay, again, whatever reason you might give, and there's many different reasons because the Gemara doesn't provide a reason and the commentaries try to come up, but there's a, we assume they didn't come into the city and didn't rape the women, okay, because they, they want to respect them, probably not because they really respect them, but they want to keep good relations with the people inside. To which the Gemara says, I don't get it though, but theoretically, one of them could have snuck in and, you know, gone in and raped a woman just because in general, the authorities of that, you know, of the army there, but men are men and they'll do what they do. And maybe they came in and raped a woman. So it's a case where there's people on guard. So then the Gemara says, I don't get it though, right now. You ever do shmira in, in the army or, you know, you're watching. What often happens? Somebody falls asleep on guard. To which the Gemara says, Yevshar Delonai Maporta, right? The guards might fall asleep. Some guy might sneak in, rape a woman. Don't you have to worry? These women can't marry, go back to their husbands for that chance. I'm a rabbi lady. Ah, it's a case where they put on, right? They're besieging the city and they put guards around. They put like besides guards, people, they put chains and they put dogs and they put sticks and they put geese. And if anybody tries to go through, right, this is like saying they put barbed wire, you know, or something like that. Anyone tries to get through the geese and the dogs start barking and the wood starts moving and making noises and the chains make all this noise and everybody would know. So they made sure that nobody went in. And then you could let, let all the women in the city be saved and be allowed to go back to their husbands. Amar Rabbi Abba Barzavda, Pligi Bar Rabbi Yudha Nesiyah Verabanans, Rabbi Abba Barzavda said that Rabbi Yudha Nesiyah and the rabbis disagreed about this. Chad Amar Kam B'Karkom Shomachut, Kam B'Karkom Shomachut Acheret. Okay, so they distinguished between these two cases, as we said before, and Lo Kash Yelev Elomidi. And they didn't raise any of these questions that we raised in the Gemara here. Bechad kashile, in other words, one of them, we're going to see now, they didn't exactly have a machloket, just that one of them gave this exact distinction we talked about and didn't ask any other questions. And the other one, chad kashile kohane, the other one asked all those questions. That's after one said it, the other one started asking all those questions. And umishane kigon demahadule lamata shushilta vakalba begavsa vaavsa. And he answered it back, the answer that we gave here. So it's not really adding anything. It's just saying that there was this conversation that went on between them, the same kind of thing where they, said something, and then one didn't ask the question, the other did, they did ask the questions, etc. If in that city, though, where we're worried that people were raped, women were raped, well, if there's a hiding place that the women could go to, it saves all the women who are married to Kohanim, they can claim, now this is a good question, do they have to claim it themselves or can we just assume that they went to that hiding spot? Because women, we can assume, right, will do anything not to get raped. 
by Rabbi Yirmiya. Rabbi Yirmiya loves to ask interesting or nudniki questions. So Rabbi Yirmiya asks here, What if the, the cave or the hiding place is only enough for one person? So can we assume if we look at each woman who was married to a calling, we can say, oh, maybe you were in the hiding spot. Oh, maybe you were in the hiding spot. And in that case, save them. To which, right, he asks, Do we say each woman it's as if you could have been in there, you could have been in there, even though they couldn't have all been at the same time? Or maybe we don't say that. To which they ask him, Very famous case, comes up in Sachim, it's a mission in Tarot. What's the difference between the case of two paths? So what's the case of two paths? There's two paths. One, there's impurity there underneath, and one, there's no impurity. Right? There's dead body buried underneath one of them. One person went one of the paths, and then he touched all sorts of things that were pure. One went in the other path, and then he touched all these pure, these pure items. The question is, one of them, we know each one went on one of the paths. We don't know where the impurity is, but we know that there's definitely impurity under one of them. So one of them is definitely impure. So what do we do? Rabbi Yehuda Omer, im nishal zeb ifnatsmo, v'zeb ifnatsmo, if they each ask separately a rabbi, tohorot. They're both tohorot. Everything is pure because each one we can say, we can assume, first of all, this concept, safek tuma in the public domain. If there's a safek about your tuma, which this is, safek about purity in the public domain, we are lenient. So therefore, we go leniently for each one. Shnehem ke'achat, but if they both ask together, tve'ot, because it's, it would be a lie for him to say you're both tohorot. One of them is definitely tame, so we have to assume they're both tame. Rabbi Yossi Omeil, ben kach ben kach tme'im, either which way they're going to be impure. Because, right, either which way it looks like a lie, because we know that one of them was definitely pure, impure. But I'm a Rabbi Vitem Rabbi Yochanan, but now we're going to just figure out exactly what they debate. If they come and ask the question together, they're definitely both impure. If they come separately, definitely everyone agrees totally. If only one of them comes forward, but in asking the question, he explains what happened to him and happened to his friend. And then he asks the rabbi, what am I supposed to do? So, Mar Rabbi Yossi said, this is like two of them coming together because he's giving the whole story of both. And even though the rabbi is just saying, you're tahol, even that sounds like it's a lie. Umar And Rabbi Yehuda says, no, because he's only asking about himself. The rabbi just says, you're tahol, right? And he doesn't say anything about the second guy. So that doesn't necessarily look like a lie. And therefore it's okay. The Hachanami. Now, let's go back to our case, right? Remember what our case is. Who can remember? There was this hiding place. It was only enough for one woman. So we know that not all the women could have been there. On the other hand, right? So what do we say to them? So Hachanami came on to Shari Le Kulu Kebata Chadami. Since he's going to permit all those women, it's like all of them coming asking the question at once. So, to which the Gemara says, Hachi Hashta, what you're comparing apples and oranges. In that case, for sure, one path had impurity there. But in our case, who's to say that she was raped? Nobody. There was no definite rape here. It's just that we can make assumptions. That maybe there was rape. There was definitely nothing definitive, and therefore, we're not going to forbid them. By Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi now asks, What if the woman says, I didn't hide in that hiding spot? So we assume right now she could, right? She could claim that or... We can claim that for her. What if she comes forward and says, I did it? But she also says, Loni Tmeti, but nothing happened to me. I wasn't raped either. Mom, me, I'm Rina, I'm moving out. I'm a bet. Do we say, Mali the Shakir? What's a Mali the Shakir? Mali the Shakir is, is kind of like a Migo. Differences I'm not going to get into right now. It's complicated. Are there differences? If so, what are they? Mali the Shakir means, what does she gain by lying? In other words, if you think she's lying, why did she, if she wanted to, she just could have said, I hid in that cave or wherever hiding place. The fact that she didn't say that means she must be telling us the truth because what she's doing is actually incriminating herself by saying, I didn't hide there because that's her, that's what saves her. So what does she gain by lying, right? In other words, she must be telling the truth. Oh, Dilma Lomrina, maybe we don't say that. So let's see, could we use Amalia Lashak here? Well, let's find a different case where we're going to see whether we use it or not. 
How is this different from the following case that comes up in the eighth chapter above the Metziah? There was a guy, he rented out a donkey to his friend. When he rented the donkey, he said to his friend, Don't go the way of Nahar Pekod, because it's always wet there. My donkey could fall and slip and die. Go that way. Maya, there's no water on that path. Well, what did the friend do with the renter? Azal iu be'orcha de nahar pekod. He went there anyway. Umi tchamer and the donkey died. Atzal kamei de Rava. They come before Rava. Amar le in be'orcha de nahar pekod. Azal comes the guy who took the donkey. He said, "You're right. I actually." He said, "It's true. I admit. I went nahar pekod, even though you told me not to. But miu, but lo avamaya. There was no water that day, and that's not why the donkey died." Amar Rava mali the shakir. Right? Ah, uh, we must believe this guy based on Amalia the Shakir. He could have just lied and said, Ibai, if he wanted to. Amalia, but Orcha Denarish, Asli. He could just say, I went on the path of Narish. But Amalia, Abaye, Abaye says, No, you can't use Mali the Shakir here. Mali the Shakir, Mimkom Edim, Lo Amrinan. This is a case where we have testimony. What testimony do we have? We didn't have any witnesses. Well, it's so obvious that Nahar Pakot has water all the time that it's as if we assume there were witnesses that say there was water there. So, we can't use a Mali the Shakir when there's witnesses to back up his, to go against him, basically. The witnesses go against him and say, right, there's no way there wasn't water there, in which case it weakens his claim. So now we want to compare that to our case, to which the Gemara says, Hachi has to what you're going to compare the cases, right? We want to say by our case, what's the Adim? The Adim is that everyone knows that women get raped when enemies come into the city. So they say no. There it's clear that there's always water there. Here, what, you're going to say for sure they were raped? It's just a concern that maybe they were raped. We keep going back to this. But yes, we're worried they were raped, but it's only a percentage of a chance, right? We don't know how much of a chance there is. When there is chashash, we do say mali l'shakir, which means if she says, I didn't hide, but I wasn't raped, we believe her. Right. Normally, what do we say? We don't believe the woman's testimony, but when she has a mali l'shakir, we can believe her testimony. Now, going back to this Eved and Shifcha. The Mishnah had said, Hey, even an Eved, even a Shifcha. To which the Gemara says, it sounds like, the Mishnah is not distinguishing, it sounds like, Afilu Shifcha didamahimna. Even her own. We're now going to talk about a woman who has her own maidservant. That will be the same, still she's believed. To which the Gemara asks on that, Uraminu, but that contradicts the following source. In Giti, and it talks about a case where a man is on his deathbed and he doesn't want his wife to be have to do chalitza. He doesn't have any children. So he says to her, this will be your get, that if I die, your get will be relevant from now. It will already start clicking, ticking from now. The halacha is he can do that, but they have to separate. They can't have relations. So now the halacha is, lo tit she can't be alone in a room with him anymore from that point on, only with witnesses. Even a maidservant, even a slave. Remember, we're talking about Canaanite slaves and maidservants. Chutz me, but here comes a big except for the maidservant is indentured to her and she's very strict with her maidservant. Her maidservant will do anything she wants. So if she wants to be with her husband and sleep with him and wants nobody to know about it, she'll swear her maidservant to silence or she knows her maidservant won't say a word about her and won't incriminate her. So therefore we don't believe the maidservant is not a proper watch watch woman here, okay? So that seems to say we don't trust the maidservant. So why do we trust the maidservant to say that, right? If she comes and says, I was with her the whole time and nothing happened. She wasn't raped. And yet in the case, when she goes alone to room with the man, we don't trust her. I want to already point out, we'll see this later, but there's a bit of a difference here. In the case of the Yichud, where they're alone in the room and he gave her the get, all she has to do, right? The reason for the witnesses is that they'll come forward and say, we saw, they slept with each other and then the get's going to be disqualified. The maidservant will just be silent, won't say anything. That's different than in our case. In our case, we're worried that the maidservant might lie and say, I was with her the whole time and nothing happened. It's a little different to be silent than it is to lie outright. 
We'll get to that only later. But we're going to have three answers to this question. That would be the nature of the third answer. Amara Papi. Bishvuya Hikilu. We're going to be more lenient with the Shvuya. We already talked about this, right? We're lenient with the Shvuya because either, number one, we're, um, we're worried that... Um, one second. Right. We, we've we been saying this all along. We don't know for sure that she anything happened. It's just the rabbis are concerned that maybe. So because of a concern, maybe we're going to be lenient. That's number one. Number two, the Meiri says that we assume the women are going to try to make themselves ugly. No woman wants to get raped. So she'll do anything she can to avoid being raped. And therefore, there's also less of a chance that she actually got raped, right? To the extent that women can control this kind of thing. Rav Papa Amar, Habashiv Chadida, Habashiv Chadide. The mission never meant her own maidservant is believed. No, his servant could be believed, but his maidservant, but not her maidservant. No, wait, but how could you say that she's not believed according to our mission? Now we're going to see why the mission thought it was pretty clear that her maidservant would be believed. Hakatan, um, Hakatan, it says in the mission, the only one who's not believed is the person himself, which means her or her husband, not her maidservant. To which they answer, right? It would be implied from there, the shifcha, that's still part of the question, would be believed. To which the Gemara answers, the maidservant is considered like herself. When it says you can't speak about yourself, can't testify about yourself, it means you and any extension of you. Your maidservant is really an extension of you. Okay? And that it's included in that. So Rav Papa actually doesn't agree with the question. He basically said it's not a question. The mission never intended to permit the maidservant's testimony, right? Her own maidservants. Whereas Rav Papi said, it's a difference between get and shvuya. And right, a woman taken into captivity. Third answer, and this goes back to the one I mentioned earlier, Rav Ashi Amal, Hava Hava Shifcha Dida. They're both talking about her own maidservant. Vishifcha Mikhsechazia Vishatka, the maidservant in the, first, in the case of the get, might see, but she'll be silent to protect her, right? Because she's scared of her mas- master. There, the silence is what will permit her woman, right? And therefore she's not believed. What would happen here if she was silent? If we don't know anything, we assume the woman was raped. So her silence will actually forbid her maids, right? The, the woman, the master, mistress. And therefore, she is believed. Okay, well, to which they say, wait, it's not just that we're worried about her keeping her mouth shut. Maybe she'll outright lie by us. Aren't we worried that she'll outright lie and say nothing happened here? To which they answer, two, she won't do. Now, this isn't exactly two. What it means here is silence, we're worried. She might just not provide information, but we're not worried she'll outright lie. To say she wasn't raped when she was raped, that she's not going to do. To just be silent, right? Someone says, did anything happen there? And she just doesn't say anything. I plead the fifth, right? That she might do because she's scared of her mistress. And how do we have proof of this? There was this case of Mari Bar Isik, where maybe Hannah Bar Isik, totally different case, but the same issue. Atale Achami Bechosai. Bechosai is this faraway place, far away from the mainland of Babel, where people were living. They had a, a brother who was far away in Bechosai. Apparently the father must have gone there. They must have seen the brother once or twice and then left him years, right? For many years, didn't see him. And apparently Isik, uh, Isik died, the father. Amrle, all of a sudden the brother comes on the scene. I want to have his property. Amrle, comes Mari or Kana, we're not sure which one, comes and says, I know who you are. Until the Kamei Rav Yosef, the brother brings him in front of Rav Yosef. Rav, I'm sorry, the Kamei Rav Chista. They bring him in front of Rav Chista. Amrle, Rav Chista says, right? He says, "My brother's lying. He's saying he doesn't recognize me. It's not true." To which Rav Chista says, "He's not lying. Shop your Kamerla. He's saying the right thing." Dirtiv, here's my proof. Vayakir Yosef at the Chave him loikiru. Yosef recognizes brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Milamed shiatzav lo chatimat zakan uba chatimat zakan. Yosef, when he was clean shaven, right? He was young. When he was older, he had a beard. They didn't recognize him, right? He looked very different. So the fact that he says he doesn't recognize you doesn't mean anything. It could be he really doesn't recognize you. So comes Rav Christi, says to the brother, he came from Bech he says, go bring proof that you're the brother. And then you can get your money. Amalei, the brother says, I, I can't. I'd like to, but I can't. Why? 
Itlisa, they have witnesses, but Mr. Finu Mine, they're scared to testify. Why? To Gavra Alamahu, because this brother of mine, Murray or ha, or Hana, whichever one, he's a thug, right? He's one of these guys. He's like a mafia guy. He's going to, you know, we don't know what's going to be, but, right, everyone's scared of him. Amarle Ledide Zil Aitinu Atelava Chilchu. So now he says to him, says Ledide, he says back to the brother who's the, the bully, go bring, okay, go Aitinu At. You bring testimony then that he's not your brother, okay? And then, right, if you can't bring testimony that he's not your brother, we're going to take the possessions from you and give it to him, right? Half of it. Amarle. So comes the Murray or Hannah, and he says, Dina Hachi, what kind of judgment are you giving to me? He says, um, What are you talking about? The law is right here comes this thug kind of guy who's a bit of a bully, and he says, I know what you're talking about. The law says, If he wants to take money from me, the burden of proof is on him. So here comes a really important line Amrle. Uh, okay, sorry. He says, He says, listen, that's true in general. But in this case, since you're the bully and you, his witnesses won't come forward because they're scared of you, the laws change. And basically, you're the one who has to provide proof. Okay, because of this unique situation, you and your friends who are bullies, the burden of proof lies on you. So now here comes our main point. But aren't we worried if these guys are thugs and bullies, they could bully people into lying falsely under oath. So they could get somebody to come and lie and say he's not their brother. What's going to stop them from doing that? To which the Gemara says, Tarte lo avde. They might be strong enough to scare people into not coming forward and testifying, but that's not enough to get people to actually outright lie for them. That already is a whole different story. And that supports what we just said before about the maidservant. We're not worried she's going to come and lie. And that was the third answer that we had to resolve the contradiction that really she's believed to come and say, my, my mistress wasn't raped because we're not worried she's going to lie. She might be silent, like in the get case, and just not say that something transpired between her and her husband, but not not to the extent that she will actually outright lie. Lema Kitunai. Now let's suggest that this whole thing about her own maidservant is a machloket between Tanaim. Zoedut Ishvisha. For this kind of thing, for a, for a woman who was taken into captivity, we accept a man's testimony, a woman's testimony, just like with, right, if a woman's husband dies, Tinok with Tinok, even young children, Avia Vima, even her mother or her father, Achia Vachota, her brother or her sister, who can't though, Avalo Bina Ubita, Avalo Avdavashikata, not her son or her daughter, and not her maidservant or her servant. What do you see here? Shifchata is not allowed. Vitanya Idach, and there's a different bride to this, says, Akol Nemanim, Chutz Mihemena Ubala. Everyone is believed to testify, except for she and her husband, which seems to say her maidservant would be. So, Let's assume it's a machloka tanaim, to which the Gemara says, well, it sort of depends which of the three answers you used before. To Rav Papi and Rav Ashi tonight, Rav Papi and Rav Ashi both said, right, we made an exception by Shvuya, or, right, we're going to say, we don't think she's going to lie that much, we will believe her. Both say the Shivcha is believed. Then this source that says, lo Shivchata must disagree, and there must be two different Tanaitic opinions, and they just hold by one of them. But to Rav Papa, but Rav Papa, who said that theoretically we believe, right? Um, her, right? Her, we don't believe her maid servant. Maybe there's really no machloket here, which maybe you can explain the bright as to actually be working with each other. How could you do that? So first of all, they say in um, when it says, "Remember before Rav Papa before we said." Hey, Mena herself includes her maidservant. So then both sources will be saying no maidservant, right? Not her own maidservant. And then it all works together and there's actually not a debate. To which the Gemara says, you're right. It's not a machloka tanaim, but for a different reason. 
when it says we will accept your maidservant, meaning only she's not believed, but theoretically we could say her maidservant is believed, that's only if she's in Sichalafi Tumaf. She tells us a story, right? She, in the context of something, it becomes clear that she was always with her and nothing ever happened, then we will accept her testimony. But if it comes in the form of testimony, we won't accept it. And then again, it's not a machloket, it's just each bright is describing a different scenario. Just like when Rav Dimi came, he said in the name of Rav, uh, sorry, in the, uh, he said, Rav Hanan Kartigna Mishtai. Sorry, I said Rav, it's not true. He said that Rav Hanan Kartigna told me, Masse Rabbi Yosho ben Levi. There was a case of Rabbi Yosho ben Levi, but Amrila. Some people say it was Rabbi Yosho ben Levi told the story, Mishtai. Masse Balifne Rabbi. And he said the story was in front of Rabbi, okay, whoever the story happened in front of. There was a guy who was telling a story randomly. Amal. This didn't have to do with a maidservant, it had to do with a son. But remember, in the bright, it says no sons and no maidservants. Uh, you know, not her own maidservant. And the son said, we were taken into captivity by these Gentiles. I went to get water from the well and I was always with my mother. And I went with to get wood. I was always watching over my mother. And Rebbe, or whether it was Rebbe Yashob and Levi, permitted her to um, get to marry a Kohen. Okay, so with that, we end to the, when we start with the new Mishnah. He says, he swears in the name of the Beit HaMikdash, the Ma'on, on this place, I swear that I was with my wife the entire time when the Gentiles came into Jerusalem and nothing happened. They say, sorry, we can't accept your testimony about yourself. This kind of corroborates the previous mission. Tana, the Brita says, despite that he can't live with her anymore, he can designate a house within his courtyard for her to live in. And we're not worried that they're going to end up sleeping together. But when she leaves, she leaves first and then the sons leave. Or children, or she nechneset, nechneset besof bana. We try to make sure that she's never alone on the property with her husband. Right? She always makes sure the kids go in first, and then she goes in. Bye, Abai. Abai asks, Maula so begrusha king. Can you do the same thing with a divorced wife? Can she stay on the property? Hatamu de bishfuyi hikilu. Do we say only by shfuyi we're lenient? Aval hachalo. Remember, we had all these reasons for leniencies but maybe not in a divorce case. Or maybe there's no difference. I'm going to leave you with this question and we will start our Tashma at the bottom of the daf in tomorrow's daf to see maybe we can get to an answer from the next upcoming source. That I will leave you for today, everybody. Have a great day.